So today we're going to be jumping into this. It's going to be uh, Son of God Part 35, Beware of the Leaven. So and I did this one the opposite way, Jonathan. I put, I put the, the capital O on that one and not on the other one. So, hey, I'm just trying to keep you on your toes, bro. That's all. So, but let's, uh, let's put it there. That's better. So in Matthew, uh, Matthew 16, uh, chapter 16, verse 1 through 12, it says, And the Pharisees and Sadducees came and trying him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. And he answered, he said to them, When it is evening, you say, Fair weather, for the heaven is red. In the morning, stormy weather today, for the heaven is red and outcast, overcast. Sorry, You know how to discern the face of the heaven, but you are unable to discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, that no sign shall be given to you except the sign of the prophet Jonah, a.k.a. Jonah, and he left them and went away. I love the way Yeshua handles business. In verse 5, it says this, And his taught ones came to the other side and had forgotten to take bread, and Yeshua said to them, Mind, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned amongst themselves, saying, because we brought no bread. <laughs> I got to be honest with you. You know, whether this being, you know, for some of it might mean the taught ones, like not just the 12, but the others. Or if this was the 12. Let me say this. I'm sure sometimes your shoe is kind of like going, how long have I been with you guys? <laughs> you think I'm talking about bread? Come on, guys. As he explains to him what he means in the next one, he says, but Yeshua, but Yeshua, aware of this, said to them, O oh, you of little belief, why do you reason among yourselves because you brought no bread? Do you still not understand, neither remember the five loaves of the 5,000, how many baskets you picked up? Do you not remember? He says, or, or seven loaves of the 4,000, and how many large baskets you picked up? This ain't about bread, guys. Listen to the words I'm speaking. He goes on to clarify it again. He says, How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? But beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but how the teaching, teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Oh. Let me bring this back up right here. One of the things I wanted to point out, too, that I thought was a kind of an interesting side note for me was, and I don't know if this means anything or not to this, but it dawned on me that what day was it that Yeshua got crucified on? The fourth day of the week. But what was significant about that day of the week? What would it have been to Yeshua if he just did the Passover? First day of unleavened. So it's interesting that on the day of unleaven, he's speaking about the leaven, and he took on all the sin of the world upon himself on that day on the cross. So I don't know. I just thought there was kind of a, there, there, there might may or may not be something there, but just something, hey, just a little side note, a little pastor side note, in my brain, that how he was crucified uh, on the day, the first day of actual unleaven. So. Then Matthew 16, 24 through 25 says, And Yeshua said as taught ones, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his stake and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. So here we have a couple of things that's going on. Jesus is warning them about the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Why do you think he's warning them about this group? Why do you think he's warning them about this? And it's not, let me say this. Because this can be sensitive for some people, and I understand. I am not attacking people. And actually, I'm not attacking anybody. But what I'm doing as a pastor is I'm pointing out that there's something wrong here with the system that was in place. And when we go back, and we and if you go back and you and you and you start studying the Dead Sea Scrolls, you start studying out the history of Israel, you start studying out the history of Israel, going all the way back to the Maccabees. Matter of fact, when you go back to the Old Testament, there is not one time that Pharisee or Sadducee that I know of personally has ever mentioned. Has anybody here ever heard that, that, that name of that group ever? Right? So we know through the history that this is a this is a group. I, mean, I got a excuse me. I got one of my mustache here that keeps like 
tickling me. But anyway, <laughs> it's annoying right now. But anyway, we, we know that from their history, we can go back to the Dead Sea Scrolls and the writings. We can go back to the to the oral Torah. We can go back to the Talmud, Babylonian Talmud. And we can see at a point in history when this group comes into power. And when this group comes into power, that means something else has to be usurped. Period. This was not a ordained by God. Hey, you guys are the ones that are going to go forth and going to be the leaders of my people. There was a usurping that took place in the history. This isn't just me thinking about or me making it up. You can go back and read it for yourselves. Go do your research on this at about 165-ish B.C. And there's a lot going on that we're not going to cover in this. And I don't know if I ever will. Maybe someday down the road. But maybe I'll explain to you why I don't do Hanukkah. And it's not that important why I don't do Hanukkah. But maybe somewhere down the road the Father wants me to share with you what was actually probably going on at the time that we realized that this was just another deception layer that was put in place. And around this time of this whole Maccabean revolt, that there's this usurping of God's priestly people that of the Zadok priesthood. And when you start going back and you start looking into the history of things, you realize that a core moment was taking place. To see what God has put in place, it is not for ever a man to come in and go, hey, by the way, Ryan, hey, you're part of the Zadok priesthood. That's fantastic. By the way, go, go clean out your locker. You don't have a job anymore. What do you mean? God put, oh, yeah, but God's given us authority now, so don't worry about it, Ryan. Hey, it'd be good. You can get your job doing something else. Don't sweat. Yeah. <laughs> but basically, this is what's taking place. And we see through their history this system and this power come into place. And they're in what we call a Korah moment. If you don't know who Korah is, it was a cousin of Moshe. Korah, the cousin of Moshe, at some point goes, Hey, by the way, Olivia, you and your family, we you know more. You know more. We're gonna take. We're gonna take control. We're gonna take power. We're gonna be the ones in charge. You got it. Now, with the same thing with Korah, God did not go to Korah in a vision that night and go, "Hey, Korah, by the way, I want you to go up to Moshe, tell him he's lost his job, tell Aaron he's out of he's out of business, hand you over to staff of authority." None of this took place. This was someone out of their own flesh going. By the way, I don't like you being in charge, Moshe. So I'm going to usurp you with my family. How did that work out for Moshe? Or not for Moshe, how did that work out for Korah? For Moshe, it worked out great, <laughs> by the way. <clears throat> there is no difference here, ladies and gentlemen, when God had placed the order of the priesthood, that we can go back to the, to, to the time of David and Solomon's temple, and we see that God himself placed the sons of Zadok as my priestly order forever. We can also go back in history and see where this order gets usurped. They pull the core on them. This is why I believe that when, when they show up at the time of Jesus' baptism, and John's not pulling any punches, by the way. When he sees the Sadducees and the Pharisees coming, what does he say to them? Hey, who told you of the <laughs> impending doom, you brood of vipers, you whitewashed sepulchers? Did you come to repent? He's not playing with them. To see... John, being a prophet and more likely a high priest at that time, was telling him like it was. Because he says, I know what you did. Don't think there won't be any retribution or, not, or, or repercussions for this. Don't think you're getting away with this. Does someone warn you? Because you know what happened to anyone, the core, you know what happens to anyone who usurps, who God puts in place. Judgment is coming. So he's not playing with them. He's telling them straight up, hey, judgment's coming for you, brother. So we see here that when we get to the point of the story, when Jesus is warning, he says, by the way, I need you to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. That system is in place. I need you to be very careful. Matter of fact, Yeshua has been, been on record as saying, hey, when they teach in the temple, when they're sitting on the seat of Moses, listen to the words from the Torah, because that is my word. That is me, the word in flesh. He says, but don't do what they're doing. Don't keep these customs that they're keeping. Don't, don't be adding into the word. Don't be doing all this other. No matter of fact, he tells them, matter of fact, hey, when you're standing out in the street, Nick, don't do what they're doing. Don't have these long, drawn-out prayers. Don't have your zitzis that's dragging the ground. 
you know, they'll be out there for everyone to see you. And when you are fasting, to let everybody know, oh my goodness, I haven't eaten all day and I have fasted and I am so holy. Look at my ZZs. I mean, just look at them. I just let them weave this morning. I got them for half price. So. <laughs> He's warning them for a reason. Hey, and for all of this, what is what is the foundation of our faith? And I know, listen, I know an easy answer would be God or Jesus. That would be mine. Okay, okay. <laughs> what is the written <laughs> foundation of our faith? It's the Torah. It's open book. You know, you all look if you want to. <laughs> it's the Torah. Is the is the foundation of all of our faith. And these guys were not keeping the Torah the way they should. Matter of fact, they weren't teaching the people a problem. Matter of fact, they were adding to the works of our Heavenly Father all the time. So when Jesus says, follow me, follow him, what are we going to be following? The word, right. We're going to be following the Torah, right? Is he going to be ever doing anything that's outside the Torah? You sure? I'm fairly confident. You're fairly confident. Okay, we'll go with that. We'll go with that, Brian. Okay, we'll go, we'll go, we'll go. <laughs> Let's go to John 5, 19. It says, Therefore Yeshua responded and said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son is able to do none at all by himself, but only that which he sees the Father doing, because whatever he does, the Son also likewise does. I want you to think about that. I want you to hold on to that for a minute. Don't put it on the shelf and forget about it. I want you to hold on to that, what I just told you right now. He says, I only do what my father has told me and instructed me to do. I am the living word. I am the light that came into this world. I am what holds all of this together. And you people here don't even understand that at all right now. And that's okay. You don't have to understand that. But you do need to recognize who I am and the role that I'm playing and what I'm doing here. But see, here's the deal, ladies and gentlemen. Our Heavenly Father is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. In Psalms 102, 27 says, But you are the same, and your years have no end whatsoever. You are eternal, Heavenly Father. Hallelujah. Psalms 119, 89 says, Forever, O Jehovah, your word stands firm in the heavens. I'm going to be driving a point home here in just a minute. Probably less than a minute, maybe. Isaiah 48 says, grass shall weather, the flower shall fade, but the word of Elohim stands for how long? Forever. Does that mean a couple weeks from now? Forever is forever, right? It's, and this is something that we learn as through, going through our studies of the book of Jubilee, Jubilees is that these things are written on the heavenly tablets. It's literally probably in stone, I'm assuming, when it says tablets. I don't know. It ain't, it ain't Apple, it ain't iPod, it ain't whatever. <laughs> These are it probably, it says literally the term written in stone means something here. Malachi 3, 6, for I am Jehovah, I shall not change. Okay. And you, O sons of Jacob, a.k.a. Jacob, shall not come to an end. So just from these few verses right here, we realize our heavenly father does not change. His character does not change. Now, can he change his mind about something? If you want to go back, look in the Torah. There's that conversation with him and Moshe. God's like, hey, I'll kill them all. Just me and you will start over. And Moshe's like, well, let's don't do that. Let's not do that. Let's, uh, you know, Moshe has that moment where he says, well, but what would the people say? They'd say you brought them out with a strong hand just to let them, you know, you had to kill them all. So we see this conversation. Now, in my personal opinion, I don't think God was ever going to wipe them all out. I think he was a test on Moshe's heart. You know, to see how Moshe, what, what if Moshe went, you know what? I'm down with that, bro. <laughs> he probably wished at the time that he struck the or he struck the rock instead of speaking to it. He's like, man, I should have took that offer like a few months back. Well, God said, I'll get it. yeah, I could have been going into the promised land, me and, me and Abba. But nope, 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 nope. Couldn't do it. In Exodus 23, 13, it says, and all, In all that I have said to you, take heed and make no mention of the name of other mighty ones. Let it not be heard from your mouth. Exodus 23, 13. 
you know, we if you didn't notice, ladies and gentlemen, we serve a jealous God. And when he's given out these instructions in the Torah, they're not to be taken lightly. They're not to be taken as yeah, loosey goosey, whatever. We have an issue even to this day. We have pagan gods all around us from the vehicles we drive. And that's why earlier when I said, you know, I really don't, I really don't even want to have say where I have the ability to not have a pagan name being spoken, I don't want to do it. So instead of our anchor to truth having Saturday at 9 a.m., I learned to say every Shabbat 9 a.m. Because I want to honor my Heavenly Father with that. Where I can honor him, I know, hey, look, we live every day of the week is a pagan God. Every month is named after a pagan God. And it's been the same story for a really long time ever since it came out of Babylon. It's been the same story. And nothing's changed, except that we kind of grow up with it. We don't really think about. I don't really think about Thursdays being Thor's day. I don't think about Saturday being Saturn's day. I don't think about all. You know what I mean? It's just it becomes something that we grow up with, and this is what we do. We don't, you know. But where I am, my personal walk, I'm trying to think. In a, I know I can't change it. It's not. But where I can, I want to. When I have slides, when I have different, even when I'm doing the, the announcement for the feast days, I used to put in there, hey, we're meeting on Wednesday, blah, blah, blah. No, I'm just going to put the date and try to use as less pagan names in there as much as I can. That's just me personally. I'm not here to conv you know, convince anybody to do anything any different than what you're doing. That's just where I am. In Hosea 2, uh, 16 through 7, it says, And it shall be in that day, declares Jehovah, that you call me my husband and no longer call me by Baal. And I shall remove the names of Baals from her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. You see, ladies and gentlemen, this has been going on a long time as far as is pagan worship. And in Hosea, we, what we're having here is we're having a, uh, an event that's going to take place that the Father is speaking of. He's like, hey, there's going to come a point where the names of other gods are going to be in your mouth. And I don't want that in your mouth. And I believe in, in Hosea, I believe what he's doing, he's talking about the redemption of Israel. He's talking about, I will woo her back. I will, I will bring her back because our Heavenly Father loves his people that much. But the thing I want to kind of go into a little bit let me get this out of the way here. Yeah, I know it might be a sore subject for some, but we're going to talk about it a little bit today is about the calendar. Let me go to Jeremiah real quick though. It says, that says, Yehovah, let not the wise boast in his wisdom, let not, let not the mighty ones in his might, nor let the rich boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast of this that he understands and knows me. That I am Jehovah doing loving commitment, right ruling, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I did I delight, declares Jehovah. Ladies and gentlemen, how are we gonna know <laughs> our Heavenly Father? How are we gonna have that relationship where we understand his character? I just said it earlier, everything that we're doing is rooted in the Torah, period. Now, granted, I think there probably should be some added books into that that we have, but I'm thankful for the I'm thankful for the canon that we have right now because there's enough in the canon that we have now. There's enough in the five books. There's enough in the prophets. There's enough in the minor prophets. There's enough in everything that we have that we can see the character of our Heavenly Father. Amen. And he speaks very clearly to us through his word. Hey, by the way, don't have these other gods in your mind. That's what it is. When it talks about in your mouth, when we're mouth and we hear in the Shema, and the Shema is to do, when we go back and you do want to do a little play on words, you want to do a little study on the words, it's not just you saying it, because guess what? We're going to say Wednesday, we're going to say Saturday. It's when you're acknowledging something else other than the L of all L's. When you Shema and you do, means I'm giving tribute to something else other than I should be giving tribute to my Heavenly Father. 
And those words should not even be on my mouth, period, at all. But, unfortunately, we live in a time that they do. And it says that he understands and knows me. And I'm going to just say this right off the rip. The, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they didn't know the Father. If they did, Jesus wouldn't have called it. Jesus said, you know who your father is? He says, your father is Satan. He says, don't even, oh, don't even say you're children of Abraham. You see those stones over there? I could raise these stones up. He says, you're of your father, the devil. You're of your father, the Hasatan, a Mastema, whatever you want to call it. That's who you are of. So when Jesus himself, when Yeshua says, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees is not to be taken lightly. We're thinking, oh, maybe it's just everyday common sin. No, this is a way of life that goes beyond just you messed up. Oh, I messed up. Let me go to the temple and go sacrifice two turtle doves or whatever I need or, you know, bull ram, whatever. This goes beyond is This goes into a system that's in place that's usurping the commands of God. Jesus himself said, why? He says, hey, well, uh, none of your disciples. Didn't wash their hands, Nick. What happened there? <laughs> and Jesus is like, are you kidding me? He goes, why are you placing that above the word? And he goes into the whole speech about what goes in a man doesn't defile him. And by the way, that doesn't mean that God, Jesus declared all foods clean. And now we can eat pork, shrimp, and whatever else. Get you some spam and throw it in a can or whatever and throw it on the pan. It's like, no, that's not what that's about. All these things that ever he's talking about always went back to a heart issue anyway. Go back and read it for yourself. Had nothing to do with all of a sudden now we can, you know, shrimp's back on the Barbie, baby. Not at all. When he starts talking about beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he's saying that system that's in place. He says, you got to be careful of what's going on here because they're leading you astray. They're actually taking you from the Torah they're actually adding to the Torah. They're actually putting a noose around your neck. They're actually weighing you down to the point where now a lot of people are just like, this is my life. There's no love in this anymore. There's no loving the Heavenly Father anymore. All it became was a bunch of rules and regulations of control. I can't even walk outside my house without somebody with the clicker going, one step, two step, three, they be careful, four steps, five. Where are you going? Oh, your aunt's house? Man, unless you take some big strides there, you're gonna be over the counter, uh -huh. and go away, go over and pay your pay your dues to the temple when you do that. So I'm convinced a lot of those rules and regulations was about money. All uh, right, you messed up again, Nick. Sorry, I count your steps. I saw where you went. Go go purchase your two turtle doves or whatever. Why do you think Jesus is in there and he's kicking over tables, man? He's like, you made my father's house a, a, a house of robbers and thieves, a den of robbers and thieves. You're in here money changing because you're, you got the people so worked up on everyday stuff. They think, oh, my God, I got to go make atonement for something every other day. And I'm just having to spend whatever money I got. On top of the fact, we got tax collectors out there. They're overcharging us on top of that. And on top of that, we got Rome that's breathing down our neck on top of everything else. Why do you think Jesus, when he shows up, he says, hey, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He says, this other stuff? No, no, no. Beware of that leaven of the Pharisees. It's no good. We'll save that one for later. So what this does, it takes me into this. And this, I don't know, this could be, a, it actually it is a sensitive subject for some. And I get it. This has been a journey for three years now. And I know that me and Jonathan personally both, I can see out of our group here, have literally put in a ton of hours. We've got more books now. We've got more watched hours. We've got more reading time in the Bible. We've got more sit-down discussions at my table over here than I ever had on any other subject that I've had in my life, period. Um, please, when we finish this, um, there's a uh, teacher out there. Let me side note for one second. His name is Ed Ch Eddie Chumney. 
and he has been a Torah teacher for the last 25 years. For some of you who are new to this walk, Eddie Choney, you're like, I don't know who you're talking about. Matter of fact, a lot of you here, Ryan, did you know who he was at all? A little bit, maybe? Yeah, for years. Okay. So, but for other people, they're like, Eddie Choney, I don't know who he is. Well, he's been a teacher in this walk for 25 years, and he's been doing the Judaism thing for 25 years. And within the last year, the father has opened his eyes up to seeing some truths. Matter of fact, he is doing the Zadok counter. He's teaching on the Zadok counter. He's teaching on the priestly counter. He's teaching all these, you know, all these things that we've been discussing for a little while now. And I'm going to link his videos after this in the description because I really encourage you, if it's your first time listening, if you want to hear some really good in-depth studies on who the people were that lived in the Qumran area, a.k.a. Bessabarda, if you want to know more about the connections in the in the New Testament to these people and Yeshua and John, if you want to know more about how this is how I feel like God is now opening, he's, God is opening up uh, to us this knowledge of this. And when I see someone who's been in this walk for 25 years, we want to be in this walk going in now our ninth year. When, uh, what's the guy, Line of Land Ministries? Monty Judah, I said, yeah, yeah. Always want to call him Michael Rude. <laughs> don't tell him I said that. Monty Judah's been doing this for, oh my gosh, I don't know how long, Ryan. If he's been doing it as long as he looks old, then he's been in it for a while. <laughs> yeah. I know I'm getting my Monty Judah look going on here. I'm getting a letting the color, the natural color come in right here. But Monty Judah, I would say easily 25, 30 years in this walk, was teaching the Hello calendar a year ago. Right, Jonathan? You shared it with me. A year ago, he was telling everybody how simple it was, how easy it was to follow the Hello calendar or the, or the Jewish calendar. And all of a sudden, we get wind of he's doing the Zadok calendar now. I'm like, whoa, whoa, what happened? That's a pretty quick turnaround. And so, with that being said, this, this counter is not going away. And I don't mean as a threat or anything like that. I'm just saying it's not going away. Matter of fact, God is speaking to his shepherds. He's speaking, he's speaking to his teachers right now. He's speaking to men who's been in this walk, who've been doing it a certain way longer than I've been in this walk. Twice as long as I've been in this walk. God is revealing himself in this. And so we're going to link the studies. It's, it's, it's going to be, hey, better buckle up, buttercup, because there's going to be some hours if you're going to watch these videos. We're talking about at least six to eight hours worth of videos easily. But what we're seeing here is that we're, we're coming into more of an understanding of who the people in the Qumran area were. We're understanding more of God's proper way of keeping things. We're understanding more of who the Sadducees and the Pharisees were. We're, we're. we're having so much more of an understanding and seeing a clear picture of this that it becomes obviously blaring to me that anything other than this calendar is pagan. And that's a bold statement. I've never made a bold statement like before in my life. I'm going to make a bold statement right now. Everything else is pagan, period. And if you want to challenge me on it, that's fine. I'm not going to argue with anybody about it. If you want to email me, you want to call me, that's fine. But I'm not going to have arguments. I'm not going to have splitting over this. I love everybody. And that's the reason why I feel like this message is that important and it needs to get out. Because one of the arguments or one of the discussions was, well, how do you know Jesus wasn't keeping their calendar? It's pagan. <laughs> Everything that I just read to you in the word that says that God doesn't change, Torah is our base. Everything that I just read to you about Yeshua would tell me that he would not keep a Babylonian calendar. Period. And that's going to be really heavy for some people to hear, but I'm almost going to be, I have to, I have to just share this out of love. Not, I'm going to tell you right now, it never has to do with me being right about nothing. If we go into an argument for the sake of just being right, we'll compromise truth every time. Because if I'm wrong in somewhere, I'll repent of it, and I promise you I'll repent of it and say, my bad. 
but I can promise you there's been enough hundreds of hours put into this. This is recorded in their Babylonian Talmud writings. This was the counter they brought out of Babylon. So there is no way in Hades that my savior, my king, my Mashiach is going to keep a pagan calendar. And if you're watching this right now, you go, oh, it wasn't pagan. How you? Hey, do your own research. Go do your own research. Matter of fact, I encourage you to listen to, uh, to Eddie Chummy's teachings. So he's going to go over a lot of this. Matter of fact, through his teachings, I've ordered at least, I think, five books that are coming in the next week. And I'm going to tell you this also. If you don't have hard copies, this is a side note. If you don't have hard copies of your of Bibles and of uh, teaching material, you go, oh, I got all that saved on this, or I got all, no, no, no. I'm going to tell you right now, there will come a time when the information that we have will not be available. And me and Jonathan both, and, and Nick both, we've been like, and Ryan, you need to do the same thing. If there's something in your brain, you need to get a 1611 Bible, you need to get a Geneva Bible, get your Septuagint. Uh, get your different things. I would say get your hands on a real copy of a book and hold on to it. You can also download digital stuff with stable files. Oh, I know, but a file can be like, I mean, yeah. yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, that's cool to do that, to put it on a file, but at the same time, I like to have that physical copy so that I know. Because if that file ever gets corrupt, or that, that's that's it. It's a wrap, right? So like to say, Nick, it's a wrap. It's a wrap, it's a wrap yeah. So that being said, when we go and we look at this, and I know that you know we we've had our back and forth a little bit with people in conversations, and not to be ugly about any of it. And they said, "Well, they talk about intercalations. They talk about well, all calendars need to be intercalated. That's that's true to a certain extent. But here's the deal: one's pagan and one's not. So if I'm going to err on side of something, I'm going to err on what I believe that the priests were keeping. You know, there's a reason why this information has been given to us over the last 20 years. There was actually an effort put in place to subdue and to keep us away from the knowledge that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. You can look that up online. For the first 20 years, at least, of the public or the, or the information that was coming out about the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were like, we can't. You have people who are suppressing that. And it's only been within the last 20 of what, the set last 70? Roughly 70 years? 20 of the last 70 that we're actually getting information that we're going, whoa, hey, man. Game changers. We're seeing things. We're connecting dots we never connected for. Before, before the Dead Sea Scrolls, before all this, guess who John the Baptist was to me? I don't know who John the Baptist really was. All I thought was some, some crazy dude that was out there telling the people the world was in with uh, wearing weird clothing and eating honey, or locusts and honey. He probably didn't brush his teeth or brush his hair. <laughs> and Jesus, in my mind, is going and calling out. Am I going to be honest with you? When I was younger as a Christian, like he's calling, I got a greatest prophet ever. What? I mean, I, I always thought it was kind of weird. And he's baptizing people way over there. I mean, outside the city. I mean, I don't. What's. You know, and he's yelling at these guys, calling them brood of vipers. What's up with John? Man, he's getting his head cut off now. What's up? But when you, when the Father now is giving us information and he's revealing these things to us, you start going, oh, I can read about this community that lived back then. And by the way, the name of this community was called The Way. And it's kind of interesting that Jesus called himself The Way the truth, and the life. I don't think it was any coincidence that if we go back and we look at it, that John and Jesus are related. It's no coincidence that prophecy is fulfilled when Aaron marries a lady from Judah, Elizabeth, his wife. It's no coincidence there when all these things start lining up. It's no coincidence there when John and, and um, Yeshua is having this conversation. He's in jail going, hey, are you the one? And I've always thought every time I've read that, I'm like, was he scared? Was he like not sure now? Was he kind of backpedaling? He's like, are you really the one? No, what it was within the written documents of the Dead Sea Scrolls of their community, it says this is exactly what the Messiah will do when he shows up. John wasn't, I'm looking at it now, John wasn't afraid to die. John was probably saying, hey, don't threaten me with a good time. 
I'm not worried about you. I'm not worried about you cutting my head off. I've done my part in life. I've done what I, I, I was the forerunner for him. I've done my part. But when Jesus says, hey, tell John, the, the blind received their sight, the lame walk, the dead are rising, all these different things, he's quoting back to the, you can pull it up in the Dead Sea Scrolls yourself. He can pull it up and go, oh my God. So, so John, knowing this, will go, thank you. Now I can die in peace. Here's your sign. That's right. <laughs> So I mean this with all love, that in, within the body, there is an illness. And that we have too many of us who are doing what is right in our own eyes. We have an illness in this body where we have so many fractions and divisions over counters and over moons and everything else. It's unbelievable. We have an illness in this body where we can't even come together. Some people can't come together at all because they're so dogmatic about what they believe in. They can't even be in the same room with other people who believe different from them. Let me just say this. If you continue to do the hello, you continue to do the creation count, you continue to do any of these things, I'm not going not to love you any less. But I will tell you that I've gotten more flack on my end for following the Zadok counter or the priestly counter as well, I like to call it. Where grace is given, some of that wasn't received back. I mean, some of that was like, uh, I know people personally who live in other states who have been excommunicated out of their community for following the, the priestly counter. And I'm going, whoa, time out, homie. This is not how this works. So now we just got more hurt upon more hurt. But I'm going to tell you this right now. If you're following these other calendars, they're pagan. If your days at all intersect with a Sabbath or profane any of the holy days in that way, it's not God's. He says, I do not change. And when we go back and we, we look at the calendar. We look at where it came from, who was keeping it. We go all the way back to King David. We go all the way back to the words of our Heavenly Father saying, this is my order. Our heavenly father has always kept their remnant, period. Go back to the time of um, Isaiah, not Isaiah. Um, who am I thinking of? The prophet, the one, uh, I just drew a blank. The one where he killed of the prophets of Baal, Elijah. Go back to the pro go back to the prophet Elijah when he was like, hey, they want to kill me. He goes, Elijah, what are you doing here in the cave, bro? What are you doing? Well, see, she yelled at me and I got scared and I ran and they're going to kill me. He goes, and that's going to be it? He goes, no, no, no. He says, I got 7,000 around the corner who haven't been in need of bail at all. See, God throughout the time, throughout the scriptures, has always kept a remnant. And I believe this community that was living at the time was a remnant of our Heavenly Father, period. And when we, when we think there's a 400-year gap between the last thing that's written in, in our Bible that we have today until the time that Jesus shows up, Oh my God, there was, there's not a gap there. It's just because we don't get to see it. The people who lived in that community were writing prophetic stuff left and right. God was speaking to them. When we read in 1 Samuel today uh, in chapter 3, and it says, and the word of God was kind of like, it wasn't there. It wasn't a lot of visions back then, was it, Nick? God, it kind of went silent a little bit. This community who was keeping the way that was keeping the proper order they, God was speaking to them left and right. And you can go in there in a book to buy the book is 622 pages to download it. I don't know why it's more, but mine was 822 pages, 200 more pages. Maybe it was a new edition. I don't know. But you can download the Dead Sea Scrolls and you can see the community. You can see what they believe. In. You can see they believe in resurrection. You can see they believe in the, they believe the Messiah. They believe everything that's lining up with what, what the Messiah is doing. They already wrote about it before he even shows up. That's why John's saying, hey, are you the one? Hey, by the way, tell John, blind see, deaf are hearing, lame's walking. And by the way, this part wasn't really in that section there. He says, by the way, I'm going to throw a little extra in there and the dead are rising up. We have to make a decision in this walk. Choose you today who you're going to serve. And this isn't an easy message for me to give at all. 
But if you think that our Savior was keeping a pagan Babylonian calendar back then, you're sadly mistaken. Well, yeah, for the sake of unity, no. Matter of fact, go. I, I encourage you to go back through Matthew and go through Luke. I don't remember the chapters right offhand, but there's a whole chapter just about that starts off with woe. And he's just laying it out about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, did Jesus love those individuals? I believe so. When Nicodemus, who's a part of that system, comes to him by night and goes, hey, Rabbi, we know you're the one. Me and my boys over here, but I'm having to come to you in the cover at night because if the system finds out I'm here, there goes my way of life and possibly my life. That's why he shows up in the kitchen. show up during the day out in the middle of the court. Hey, Rabbi. Hey, love the message last week. It was great, brother. Hey, you know, that, that blessed message you did? That was tight. I like that. That was really good. No, he comes to him in the cover of night. He says, we know who you are. And we know that only you can do this through the power that God has given you in authority. Joseph of Arimathea is part of the system. Jesus loved him too. And he loved Jesus. Or he wouldn't have came and got his body and wrapped it and put it into a new grave. So when I'm telling you these things, this isn't about attacking individuals. This isn't about attacking a people group. There was a system that was in play then, that's Babylonian, and that system's still in play today. And God is trying to clean house. Just like we just came out of Passover, what's one of the things what we do for Passover? Hey, get the leaven out your house. Don't eat no that bread now, right? That, that cheesy gordita you got? Eh, borderline. <laughs> yeah. well, too you, you might have felt the flames from Sheol. <laughs> I'm just kidding. There's a reason why, for me, when we get to that point in, in, in those feast days, because God's saying, hey, you know what, Olivia? I need you to examine you. I need you to examine you. Ron, I need you to examine you. I need you to go in your house. Because for me and my house, who are you serving? Are you serving the Lord or are you serving the Baals? As for me and my house, what are you doing? So at this time, it's a reflection because guess what? All these feast days leads up to the end of the year when the sacrifice would take place for your sins at the Day of Atonement. He's given you that full time to get things right in your life. You don't have to wait till the Day of Atonement to go, here's all my sin. Here we go. And go for another year. That's almost like taking advantage of grace. Well, we got our bull. <laughs> Good job. Now we can do whatever we want and then we'll have it all atoned for at the end of the year again. That's not the way it works. Yes. Can I share something? I don't know. It all depends. How long is it? One of the things, you know, when we look at Another thing that said was when Jesus gets back, when Yeshua gets back, he'll make everything right. And I believe, you know what? I believe that. Whatever the mess is, whatever needs to be cleaned up, whatever confusion is left in this body, yeah. Our kings will go, yeah. No. And be like, yes, sir. But we don't have to wait till he comes back. If those who have ears to hear, and eyes to see and a heart to receive what the Spirit is saying. Period. I believe that right now what you're seeing is you're seeing men who've been in this walk for a really long time, and you're going to see more men in this been in this walk for a real and maybe a short time or a long time. You're going to see more men that God has placed as shepherds and teachers coming to the same knowledge. Because when it's in black and white, when it's obvious that this is a pagan way of doing things, you have to make a decision in your heart whether you're going to follow this or not. And we can no longer say, well, we don't know. No, we do know through the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, we know through the writings of the Dead Sea Scrolls that there was two counters at the time. We know that on that day that Christ did his Passover meal, 
It was a Passover meal, ladies and gentlemen. Period. He's not going to transgress his own word. And that in the Bible, the reason why we can say this, then it says what? The next day was the day of the festival of the Jews. I'm not cutting on Jew Jewish people by saying, I'm just saying that's what the word says. The next day was the day of the Jews' feast. It didn't say the feast of Yahweh. Period. So we're coming to, I think, a pivotal moment in time with this counter as more information is coming out. That we have to make a decision. That line's being drawn even more and more, to me, is deeper in the ground. Choose whom the day you're going to serve. I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm not trying to muscle you. I'm not trying to counter push. I'm not trying to do anything. But I will tell you right now that the undeniable evidence leading towards everything else is not God. And that the, the way of keeping this calendar is, it's just some decisions we're going to have to make as a body. And it's not easy. This body's been fractured and broken for a very long time. People have left this walk because of people hurting people. And that needs to end. And we need to start showing a lot more love towards one another. I'm going to share another scripture with you. It says in Galatians 3, 1, it says, Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed and crucified. Who has bewitched you? I went back a little bit of that word bewitched. Bewitched means to control. It actually means it's a form of witchcraft. It means there's, there's, it's nothing that's good. Who has bewitched you? Who has pulled the wool over your eyes? Who has convinced you that this, what you already know, is not now you're thinking something else? Who has come in and put the names of Baal in your mouth? Who has bewitched you in this? And ladies and gentlemen, for the last 200 years, we've all been bewitched. We've all been controlled to a certain degree. We've all been told lies. We've all been told a lot of different things that's not truth. Let me just say this also while it's on my mind. The way that we were keeping the calendar before was all that I had. It's all we had, Ryan. Mm -hmm. And I'm not regretting doing that. It's what we had. It's all. Look, every year I literally would grab my phone and go, Either type in it or speak into it. Hey, when is uh, unleavened, whatever year? And whatever this told me is what I did because that's all I knew. That's all I knew to do. This is what we all did. When we were, do you think I regret getting saved at 14 and being in church? No. Was it everything that we know now? All the things that we know now? No. I mean, we, we've come such a long ways away from that. I don't regret any of that. The church was good to us. The church, we, we made friendships. We did, uh, we grew in the, you know, all the good things that happened in church. Sure, there were some theologies, a lot of theologies that we now look back at and go, yeah. But did that take me away from my Heavenly Father? Did it change my relationship with my Heavenly Father? Did, you know, No. As a matter of fact, well, when I came into this walk, though, and I, and I knew the character of my Heavenly Father even more, I know that I've grown closer to my to my Abba. I realize now what Sabbath means. I realize now what the feast days means. I realize now that coming out of that system that I'm not going to be doing Christmas and Easter and Halloween and I don't even participate in St. Patrick's Day or, you know, a lot of the things that are out there, Valentine's Day. When you go back and look at all these things, they all have pagan in them. And for a lot of us, we can say, oh, that's easy. That's pagan. Right, Nick? Pagan. <laughs> But for some reason, when we looked the other way to this side and we came into it, we were a lot more guarded. We did we, we were afraid to use the word pagan. We were afraid to use those type of phrases. Two years ago, I was teaching on a symposium and on, on Passover because I knew three years ago or over three years ago, God says, hey, son, we need to get back to some basics. We need to do some house cleaning. And by the way, you're not going to be doing these big gatherings uh, at least for right now. And he hasn't give released me to do a big Passover thing. He says, we're getting back to Bible things and Bible ways. 
And when we learned about symposium and where symposium came from, for a lot of us, Jonathan, it was easy. It's like, oh, I'm not doing that no more. I still didn't understand the egg anyway. Why we have an egg on our Seder? Knowing from the other side what that could possibly mean. So when I come to you today and I tell you that if you're keeping another counter other than the priestly counter, it's more than likely pagan. It is pagan. Or completely misguided from what the truth is. And so... This is what the Father spoke to me over and over and over for a long time. Revelations 18, 4 says, And I heard another voice from the heaven saying, Come out of her, my, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. So, Ryan, this kind of goes back to when we do things knowing that it's wrong, but we do it for the sake of unity, are you also willing to take in the punishment that comes along with that? Because I'm not. I love you, but I'm not going to do what you're doing for the sake of unity. If it if it's contrary to the word, if it's proven to be something that's a pagan practice, if it, if it looks at all, smells like something that's not Torah based, I'm not doing it. Doesn't mean I don't love you. Because see here, he's warning me, says you need to come out of her, you need to come out of her ways. You need to come out of that way of thinking. You need to get the bales out of your mouth. He says, if you don't, he says, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. Guess what I mean? There's no protection for you. When everything's falling apart and God's got his set of parts over here and there's a hand of protection over them, but you decided, now I'm going to do what I want to do over here and, and whatever is right in my own eyes and yada, yada, whatever it wants to be. God's saying, then you're going to share in exactly whatever punishment they get. Period. So my final thoughts on this is that I would love to see the community grow and connect and make more meaningful memories together. I don't know. I'm trying to think of a, a good way to say this. Sometimes there's, there's not an easy way or there's not, I don't know. But one of the problems that we have with this walk is no one's willing to submit to authority. We all have a lot of independent contractors, is what I like to call it, and people who want to do what they want to do, when they want to do it, how they want to do it, and that will show up to events, will show up to gatherings, will not allow themselves to come under the leadership, will always just kind of float and do whatever it is they want. I think that's a dangerous place for you to be at. I've seen people within this wall, they show up to get what they can get out of it, and they pull right back out. And that's not right. Matter of fact, we don't even know. I'll be honest with you. We don't even know how to do community right. You think communities are showing up and eating potluck together? Community is about raising kids together. Community is about growing together. Community is about so much more. Community is about leadership. It's about elders. It's about so much more than what we have today. Because everybody wants to do what's right in their own eyes. And so what I've seen over the last nine years is that people will come, suck up your resources, and then roll out. But don't want any accountability, don't want anything else. They'll talk to them about nothing. But if they need you, they'll come get you. But other than that, then it's, and it's, you're at arm's length. And I don't know personally at this moment, I'm just speaking from my heart, how that's going to change other than people's hearts have got to change. I've been in the ministry since 18 years old. A lot of you know that. I got saved when I was 14, got in ministry when I was 18. I've been serving the Father ever since. I have been placed under authority of other pastors, of other leaders, of other people. And for me, this is a no-brainer. You show up, you gotta do what you gotta get done, what's gotta get done. And any moment you're not gonna catch me butting heads with the pastor. I'm catching me butting heads with all this. Unless it's something that's really bad and at that point, maybe you just need to get out. That's one thing. But the reason why there's so much fighting and the reason why there's so much hurt that comes back to this, this guy right here is because where people don't respect my who I am and who God's called me to be, period. 
he's just Joe. He's just that guy that had a building. He's that guy that has some property. Now he's just the guy that lives over there. You don't respect the, the position that God puts people in. And you try to treat everybody like they're all the same. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'm not any better than anybody else. I did not call myself to this. The, the hand of my heavenly father was placed on my shoulder and brought to where I am today because of him, not me. But I've seen a lack of respect for leave, not just me, but other leadership out there. Say whatever you want to say about them, talk down about them all you want to. You can do, you know, just drag them through the dirt verbally, whatever it is you want to do. I guess feel good about it later. I don't know. But I do believe we will be judged for the words that we speak. Hey, I'm included. I'm not perfect. But this body needs to learn how to give proper respect to the people where God has placed men in authority. He's placed leadership within the community. He's placed people that have a gifting in certain areas. He's like, we don't give them the proper respect that we need to give them. We just want to do what's right in our own eyes. And if I don't like it, I'll take my tour and I'll go home. That's got to change. And it feels, I'm going to tell you right now, this boy, unless I die or God says, hey, you're, you know, it's time for you to retire, I ain't going nowhere. I'm a servant of the Most High. You don't have to call me pastor. You don't have to call me anything. Matter of fact, the, the greatest compliment God ever gave me was calling me his servant, period. The other stuff is just titles. And so you know who, who is who. That's it. But if we don't start to learn in this walk how to respect that authority that God has placed out there and quit thinking that we're all theologians, that we're all whatever, and that we all have this this whatever, it's like we're just always going to be broken. This didn't cut it in the Old Testament. It didn't cut it with the way God set up his system, but it's not going to cut it today. And for those who want to live in that lifestyle, you're going to find yourself around a bunch of other people who are going to be living the same way, and good luck with that. Because I wouldn't want to live in your community at all. So there's just a few things in there I want to share from my heart that as a community, we got to do better. And my God, don't let me catch you ripping somebody up and down about something that you believe in, that you want to put your finger in their face and tell them how they're going to hell if they don't believe in a certain way or whatever else. So that ain't cutting it, man. So I'm not even here to tell, I'm not here today to tell you to change the counter you're on. I'm not here to do anything. All I want to do is, as a shepherd, my job is to lead you to greener pastures. My job as a shepherd is to show you the ways that the Father speaks to me and, and where we need to go as a body. Right. I'm not here to tell you to do anything. I'm not picking through your rice. I'm not looking at your Netflix account. I'm not looking at your Amazon. I'm not doing any of that stuff. That's between you and the Father. But what I am here to do as a shepherd, and it's not easy because sometimes I have to walk in a role, I feel like as a prophet, to say, by the way, this is wrong, and this is the direction we need to be going. And especially when I see the hand of God on other men who are godly men, and we're all, and I can, I can see the hand of the Father leading us and guiding us in the same direction. There's something to be said about that. I'm not saying that we all have to blindly follow someone. We all don't do your reading. It's nothing like that. I say it every week, and you're going to see the slide here in just a minute. That's going to say, test all things. So if I'm off my rocker, if I'm teaching you something that needs a Deuteronomy 13 test on, then by God, do a Deuteronomy 13 test on it. And let's talk about it. If I'm doing anything at all, it's going to lead you away from the Torah, from keeping the Sabbath, from keeping the feast days, from keeping anything that God says is that important to me that I do not change. If I do any of those things, but that's why I also have men in my community that I'm looking at right now that can come to me anytime and go, hey, Joe, what's up? That's accountability. That's the other thing we need in this walk is accountability. Because it's too easy for the men. I'll just say the men. I'm not even going to pick on the women. The men to go, well, I'll just take my tour and leave. I'll just do this. I've seen guys get all worked up and whatever. And instead of talking about it, instead of working through it, instead of doing whatever, I'm just going to do whatever I want. And it's more more fractures, more fractures, more fractures. I've seen it with the women too, but you know, I'll, I'll stick with the guys right now. More fractures, more fractures, more fractures.
you know, our Sukkot is coming up. Uh, we're going to be at the Santee State Park. Or Santee Park, I always put it in there. Santee State Park, October 7th through the 9th. And I would love, absolutely love, to see this community get there. And let's just blow that whole place. I mean, let me, all right, I'm using the word blow up online. Sorry. I would love to see us pack out the park. I mean, I use the word blow up. I don't want any guys showing up in black helicopters outside my house. <laughs> let me be very clear. We're not blowing up any parks. <laughs> I would love to see our body, though. I would love to see us go in there and pack that place out. I would love to see us get together as a family and share these feast days together. I would love to see that not only here, but I would love to see that across the board. I would love to see that over the uh, all of the United States, all of a sudden, all the parks everywhere getting filled up. People who are doing it at their homes, their yard, the homes getting blown. I mean, I would love to just see the body for once, for Pete's sake, get together and go, you know what? This is, we're going to do this. We're going to get rid of these other things that are clearly not the way of our, of our father, that clearly Jesus, Yeshua, did not keep. Clearly that these things are based on the wrong things. And all of us literally get on the same page together. What a delight it is when brothers dwell together. Amen. I don't know. <laughs> Vicky, do you want to read what you read last night to Susan? Is that what it is? All right, if you feel led to read it, go ahead. You need to come come a little bit closer to the mic, though. All right, my wife has something she'd like to share with everybody. I wrote this in my journal. Yes, Sheila. I'm trying not to cry now. Yeshua longs for your devotion. May you become holy and beautifully devoted to Yeshua because he's holy and beautifully devoted to you. May he redeem you in ways you never knew you needed and restore you to ways you never knew you needed and restore you in ways you never dreamed possible. May his provision eclipse your expectations beyond your wildest dreams. May his love forever change how you live, how you pray, how you give of yourself to others. May you divinely discern the difference between holy conviction and unholy condemnation. May you walk wisely without walking in fear. May you discerningly guard your heart without walling it off and shutting it down. May you learn to live freely, sensibly, and faithfully with each new day. May you perceive the enemy's attempts to bait you into sin, fear, and captivity and shut them down at every turn. You are a royal ambassador of the Most High God. May holy confidence and humble dependence mark your life in every way and may God's richest blessings be yours today. Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a river bank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Hallelujah. Woo. You know, um, real quick, I don't know if Miss Karen, if you're on here right now or not, but I promise you I would give you a connection and I had almost ground looking out at my notes. So within the Qumran community, this is what they would do. They had a covenant that you would make to be with them. I use Qumran loosely, it's about Sabara. This is the community of the believers to wait. Oh yeah, let me turn the mic back around. Thank you. So the name of the group is the way. And to be in covenant with them according to their bylaws, 
You couldn't just walk in, right, and go, hey, I want a membership. <laughs> yeah, I want to be a part of your group. They're like, okay, that's cool, 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 cool. That's going to take you three years. We're going to watch you for three years. And not only we're going to watch you, but this isn't something you're just going to pick up in one night. Oh, this is a membership rules. Cool. I'm, I'm there. I believe that what this was is this is like, hey, how serious are you? Because we're going to keep the ways of our Heavenly Father. We're going to, we're the ones who are keepers of the scroll. By the way, honey, thank you for that. It was beautiful. I know that somebody on here needed to hear that. Um, so it's three years, but you got to wait before they're like, okay, three years. You've put your time in. We watched you, Jonathan. We've seen your tenacity. You're, you're, you're keeping all the things that you need to do. Hey, now, now we will let you enter into a covenant with us. That's how important and guarded they were because they had been fractured. They had been split away from. They had been hurt. They had been like, hey, we don't even know if you're a plant or not. More likely, hey, we've had other people coming here, singing the song and doing the dance with us. But at the end of the day, they just came in here to spy on us and just to report back to the other people who we were. So three years, you pass the test, you're in covenant with that group, the way. This is my, uh, Ms. Karen, if you're, if you're on here, um, this is, or if you watch this later. So my connection to this with Paul was, oh, very interesting. Paul gets knocked off his horse. Paul is blinded. He's sent to, and I forgot the, the gentleman's name, he was sent to the house. And then Paul's not released for three years. There's a re-education taking place in Paul's life. I believe that Paul was sent to those of that community because that community just didn't live. When you go back and you research it out, they just didn't live in Bethsabara. They didn't live just in the Qumran area. They actually lived in Jerusalem. They actually had people that lived within the city also. So when Paul is blinded and sent away for three years, I believe that there's a re-education that's taking place in Paul, but I also think that he is learning about these things from somebody from that group. And they're like, hey, brother, we'll let you go out and teach this message, but it's going to be three years. We're going to make sure because we know you're, we know who you are. You're the Pharisee of Pharisees. You're the Jew of Jews. You're the uh, uh, Gamaliel. You're the, you're the guy that we know that went around and we know what happened when you were holding the coats and when Stephen was being stoned and everything else. We know who you are. So three years, you're gonna you're gonna be you're gonna be re-educated. Three years, you get to go. It's kind of interesting that within the community, the way you had to wait three years before they would allow you to come into covenant with them. So it makes me wonder if there was a connection with uh, Paul with members of because I remember the community didn't stop going. The community was there at least we know under their writings up until the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. They're still there. They're still within this framework of the city and everything else. So it just made me wonder, hey, three years, three years, maybe. What do you think, Ryan? Po possibility? Could be. Okay. There you go. <laughs> uh, what was another one? Oh, yeah. Here's here's a simple one. This is one that um, Ed Chumney, Eddie Chumney pulled out. That within this sector group of guys, they would have men who would, who would not marry. Interesting because this is why I think they're connected. Paul taught on, hey, it's better not to marry. But if you're going to burn in your lust, go ahead and marry. <laughs> so it was interesting that you had sex, these guys out of the sex of this, this group that would say, hey, guess what? I'm going to devote all my time to God. And I'm not going to marry. This is going to be me and God the whole time, right? So here's a kind of a cool connection that he made that made me think, huh. So when the disciples come to Jesus right before the Passover and they go, hey, Jesus, where do you want us to do the meal at? He goes, hey, you're going to see a guy carrying water. And when you see that guy, you're going to go to him and say, hey, the masters, you know, blah, blah, blah. You're, you know, the whole sword from there. They go on and they get the, the, the preparations. I've already got the room paid for. Don't worry about it or whatever. So the connection that Chummy makes there is very interesting. He says, who would you have most likely seen carrying water during that time? Women. Women were always going to the well. Matter of fact, some of our, fa our, our, our famous patriarchs met their wives at the well, or their wives were met at the well and brought to them. He said more than likely that this was an individual who was not married and was more likely a part of that community because he was carrying his own water. So there's, so there's a lot more, ladies and gentlemen, when you read 
and you study and you, and you look, there's nothing in, there's nothing going to be in there direct, you know, like blah, 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 direct, hidden. but it's, it is hidden. But when we go back and we study these matters out and you understand who they were in the community and what they were doing, then all of a sudden you start making little, I call them red strings or you start connecting the dots. You're like, Oh, Paul had to wait three years. Oh, so this guy was carrying his own water. Oh, and there's, and there's so much more than that. That there, there's so much more to that. But don't let me forget, Jonathan. We need to put throw some stuff up in there after this. We're getting ready to wrap up. We went a little bit longer than normal, but it's been good, guys, to be with you. Um, I apologize if I've hurt anybody's feelings or if I made anybody mad. It's not my intentions. As a shepherd, this is the hardest things that I have to do sometimes. Is I have to just. This is what the Father laid on my heart. Is what I got to share. And if we're ever going to get better, if we're ever going to be more unified, you realize we're part of the least, the most least unified group out there is the believers in the body of Messiah. Go to any occult out there. And man, they're unified. They've got a plan. They're out there and they're making it happen. And we can't even get together and just have normal get togethers. Can't even have conversations sometimes. And the enemy is loving it 100%. All right, let's finish this up. So everything I've said today, please go and test for yourselves. It says, in all circumstances, give thanks for this desire of Elohim, Messiah, Yeshua. For you do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, prove them all. Hold fast to what is good, keep back from every form of wickedness. And Elohim of peace himself sets you completely apart in your entire spirit, being and body, be reserved blameless at the coming of our Master, Yeshua, Messiah. Amen. Jude 1, 24, 25, it says, Now to the one who can keep you from falling and set you without defect and full of joy in the presence of his glory. To God alone, our deliverer, through Yeshua the Messiah, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen.